So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Uh, one thing I just wanted to remind folks of, uh, our speakers specifically, is you know talk for about 12 to 15 minutes. Uh, if you start to get pretty close to that 15 minute mark, you know two minutes or so, I'll just give a quick verbal, hey, you know two minutes left. So uh, be expecting that. Um, but yeah, so our first speaker is uh, Richard Sever. And Richard is the Assistant Director of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in New York and co-founder of the Preprint Servers BioArchive and MedArchive. Uh, Richard, you can feel free to go ahead and, and uh, share your slides and uh, get started. And I'll be timing it so you don't have to worry about timing yourself if, if that helps. <laughs> Okay, so you can hear me okay, can you? Absolutely. And mm -hmm. my screen, so I think we're good. Yep. Mm -hmm. So good. yeah, well, um, thanks very much for the invitation. I'm uh, excited to be here virtually, um, if, if not in, in real life. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about preprint, specifically bioarchive and MedArchive today. Um, but I just wanted to start by saying that um, all the things I'm going to talk about come from Cold Spring Harbor Lab. Um, so it's important to stress this is in an academic context. Um, Cold Spring Harbor Lab is a, um, a mainly molecular biology and genetics um, lab on the North Shore of Long Island. Um, but we also have a very, very long history of scientific communication. Indeed, the first meetings were held in Cold Spring Harbor more than 100 years ago. This is a, a slide from the first um, course held there. And over the subsequent 100 years, we've spent a, a lot of time in, in a number of different initiatives. I like to say we have hundreds of scientists, thousands of visitors, and millions of readers. We have a conference program, we have a graduate school, we do um, uh, residential lab and lecture courses, and we're also involved in dissemination of science with um, producing various books, journals, and preprint servers most recently. Um, and to kind of wrap, to explain the importance of preprint servers, I'd like to show this slide, which is um, a slide I show the students every year when I teach them about um, how the publishing process works. And the point here is that in traditional publication, every academic who is listening will be familiar with this. You submit to a journal. If it's a decent journal, the most likely outcome is that your paper is immediately rejected. You have to start again. You know, if you make it past the editor, then you have to run the golf gauntlet of referees. You know, if the editor still thinks your paper is halfway decent, the most likely outcome is that you have to revise the paper, which can take months. You undergo my, my, multiple cycles of this um, before anybody can actually read the paper. And then when the paper is published, most of the time it's behind the paywall. So the question is, is in the age of the web, whether we should do it this way? And I think I would argue the answer is no. And then what we should do is decouple the dissemination of the work from its subsequent certification by a journal, by posting a preprint. And so that's what I mean by a preprint, an unpublished manuscript that yes, it yet to go through the formal process of being certified um, through peer, peer review by a journal. And obviously there's a precedent for this. Um, uh, the physicists have been doing this for nearly 30 years. Archive was founded um, in 1991 and now has more than a million preprints in um, computational science, physics uh, and math. And in, so inspired by this, we launched Bioarchive in 2013. It's also a, 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 an academic non-profit service, completely free, focuses on biological sciences and isn't really intended to um, complement Archive. It's funded by Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and Cold Spring Harbor Lab. And as I say, it's, all, it's free to read and, and free to post. And interestingly, since we launched this in 2013, a number of other um, academic communities decided that this was a good idea. So there's been a real explosion of preprint servers in largely non-profit discipline specific manner, Chemis chemistry, chem archive, agriculture, agri-archive, social archive, sci archive, many of these. And we ourselves uh, last year launched um, MedArchive as a collaboration with Yale and BMJ Group um, to um, provide a home for clinical preprints. And uh, the reason for doing, make, creating a separate server was that, you know, for, for, that there are additional concerns about clinical information. So, it very much complements by archive, but it has some enhanced screening procedures. There are some additional declarations that authors have to make, um, really tailored to dissemination of this rather sort of more sensitive information. Um, so what are the benefits? Uh, why, why, why do this as an author? 
Um, as I say, the main, the main reason for um, posting preprint is to rapidly transmit the results. Um, but it's also an opportunity to get um, pre-publication feedback from colleagues in the wider scientific community so that you can improve your paper so that ultimately it's better when you send it to a journal and, and that process is, is quicker. Um, it's also a, a way to in, uh, increase visibility, especially for early career scientists. A lot of the time, the early career scientists, the sort of time course of their fellowship will be at odds with the time course of publication. With a preprint, you control the timing of dissemination. So you can say, here is the work that I've just done. You can read it right now. And this is useful for grant hiring and tenure committees who want evidence of, of recent work. And there are examples like uh, Nikolai Slavots that I cite in the bottom right here, where he got his um, first faculty position um, before the work actually appeared in the journal entirely on the basis of the, of the preprint and the cell report paper. Um, that was his, was, was, his, was his key work appeared once he was already in the job. So this slide, um, if you look at the blue curve, just shows what I mean by this delay. The blue curve is the submission to publication times for, <coughs> excuse me, for journals in PubMed. And you'll see that the, um, the median is about six or seven months, but the range goes out um, beyond two years, three years. It's not unheard of for people to spend three years um, in, in peer review. And of course, if you can disseminate it immediately via preprint, you see on the far left that's where bioarchive sits, which is dissemination within 48 hours, um, which is a major time saving. And what this means for an individual um, is exemplified by this curve by, by a former postdoc at Colston Harbor, who now has his own lab. And he describes some work he did recently where he basically he read a paper um, that he was alerted to on Twitter, it was on bioarchive. Um, uh, midway through 2017, started a collaboration with um, the author of that paper. They started sharing resources, doing experiments, and by January of 2018, they'd actually done a whole series of subsequent experiments followed up on with this, with this great collaboration, and we're actually getting results from that collaboration in January of 2018. Now, in January of 2018, the paper that you first read in midway through 2017 as a preprint was finally published in a journal pretty much in the same week that he finished the follow-on experiment. So for him, that was a seven month head start. He's, you know, he's a tenure track individual. He's got five years to make it. Seven months is a, is a really big head start. And, and our hope is that you imagine if you aggregate all those seven months together, that we really could speed up science. And um, so Steve Quake at the Biohub in San Francisco has done some back of envelope calculations that suggest if you make various assumptions for what that delay means in terms of spread of ideas and how many ideas it takes to make a discovery, you could actually get to a point where if everybody posted their uh, papers in preprints, in 10 years you could um, speed up science by fivefold, which I think everybody agrees would be a good idea. So this is just how bioarchive works when an author submits a paper. It undergoes some administrative checks. The check it kind of looks like a paper. It's plagiarism screen. It then goes to a group of affiliates or essentially um, faculty members who, who take a quick look and say, that looks like it's, it's science to me. Not if very important stresses is in peer review. They're just saying it kind of looks like science. The paper goes live and then um, uh, an author can um, resubmit a new version at any time. It's important to stress why we do have the screening process and don't just put up anything. Um, we do have concerns about ethics. We don't want to publish things that are non-science, garbage, pseudoscience or plagiarized work. There are concerns in the clinical sphere for things like um, to ensure that patients' identities aren't revealed. So you need something to have a quick look to, to check on that. And on the health side, that we don't want to post any research that could be dangerous, like um, you know, disputes of vaccine safety, um, disease transmission, we're all familiar with HIV denialism, et cetera, and, and toxicity, um, carcinogenicity disputes. You know, we're not gonna po uh, post a paper that says cigarettes um, don't cause cancer. So it's important to have that screen. Assuming you make it through the screen, which 90% um, uh, of, uh, more than 90% actually uh, papers do, um, the paper goes online, it's, it's date stamped, um, on the top right, so you get, you know, you get a, a priority signal as an author. You can define the article type. Um, we define author, um, article as new results, confirmatory results, or contradictory results. So that allows people to um, uh, uh, do reproducibility studies. The manuscript gets a DOI. And it's, there's a, there's a, um, the, the author can define the subject area, and there's a download link um, to the author's PDF. 
uh, um, the so as you can see here, this is an author's PDF. It's not typeset like a journal. It's just the PDF that the author sent in. But we do augment this with full text HTML after a couple of days so people can see uh, inline figures. As I say, an author can um, revise a paper anytime, so it's a big difference um, compared with a journal. And in the history tab, you see um, a list of all the prior versions of the article, so you can go back and look at them, as well as a revision summary uh, where an author can say, look, this is what's different now about the new version of my paper, and you, that will inform your choices a reader whether or not you want to read the new version or not. We also provide metrics, so we have article level metrics, so you can see how often a paper is downloaded and all metrics for how often it's been blogged about, other social media appearances, news mentions, that type of thing, which I think authors tend to be interested in. Um, and we have, we also have on-site commenting to um, increase discussion of, of work. As I said, we have the on-site comments, but we also aggregate um, discussions that are occurring elsewhere. So we have a roll, scrolling list of tweets about the article, uh, links to blog posts about the article, news mentions, and a number of dedicated discussion sites for frequents which are appearing. So um, uh, I'll talk a little bit about those later. And, and finally, uh, sort of in the feature list, it, we also provide links to a journal when the article is published. So, you know, after a few months of the article is published in a, in a journal, then we put a big prominent red link, which basically this article is now being published in journal. You can go and read the version of the record here. So how are we doing? Um, we actually this weekend just passed 100,000 papers. We're getting um, uh, we're about 3,500 papers per month. So I think the scientific community um, are really voting with their feet on BioArchive. On MedArchive, it's obviously a much younger server. The interesting thing here is if you look at the first half of this plot, so the, um, the, the black line is total papers, the dark bars are submissions and the lighter bars are revised submissions. And what you see is we've got sort of slow growth as expected through, through last year, um, much like we had done with BioArchive seven years ago. And then January 19th, things exploded as um, the COVID-19 pandemic hit. And we start, we've got a huge influx of papers. And before long in April, March, April, we were getting as many, we were getting as many papers on that archive as bioarchive, about 100 a day. And really, the, the, it, was, it was very timely that this was launched because it would have been incredibly useful for COVID-19 dissemination. So as I said, 100,000 papers on bioarchive now, about 10,000 on that archive. A pretty consistent 30% of these papers are revised, and sometimes multiple times, but most of the time it's just once. Um, and we're seeing um, around 30 million views a month across um, the two servers. And an interesting figure is that um, more than 70% of these papers end up um, subsequently being published in journals. That, that figure is from BioArchive. It's too early to calculate for MedArchive because we give a time lag about two years before we calculate it because it would be artificially low before then because many papers would still be in review. Um, so over this period of the last past seven years, it's been great to see these behavioral changes, many more biologists posting, reading, citing preprints. Um, now I think it's... It, very rare to find a basic science journal that doesn't allow authors to post a preprint first. Um, funders are encouraging that their grantees to cite preprints and grants. It was a big move was when I, NIH said you can include preprints in your biosketch. And we're seeing places like Rockefeller University encouraging applicants to include preprints in their applications. And, and you know, one of the things that has been nice is the, the bucking of the, re, of the recent trends to um, only talk about old data at meetings, preprints allow people to put the stake in the ground. So a lot of the time people talk, can talk about new, new research because they're confident that they've kind of put their marker in the ground by posting preprint around the time they give a talk at a meeting. Um, one of the things that we want to do with BioArchive and MedArchive is have these functions as a hub that um, promote and uh, allow evolution of the um, communication uh, ecosystem. So, um, you know, obviously, you, there's various discovery initiatives, BioArchive and MedArchive are indexed by Meta, Google Scholar, Microsoft Academic. So there are all these discovery mechanisms. We link out to, to, to journals um, and other means of, um, kind of evaluating content. And as I say, we, um, we aggregate um, third party discussions across the web um, and have um, uh, provide a home for reproducibility studies with these confirmatory and contradictory results 
categories, things that often journals in the past have not been interested in. Um, so as I said, the most obvious point of integration is journals. We have these two technologies, J2B and B2J, that allow authors to wrap to very, very easily transfer papers from bioarchive to a journal or vice versa. So more than 100 journals participate in B2J. And what this means is that an author can submit to bioarchive when they've completed the submission process, we then say, now would you like to submit to a journal? There's a big list of journals. They just click on one of those journals and we will send all that information to the journal. So that means they don't have to go through the torturous process of re-uploading all the files again when they go to a journal website. Um, we can also do the, um, the, the, the converse, J2B, so a number of journals like eLife, Embo, and Development. When you submit to the journal, they will say, you know, it's going to take us a while to evaluate this paper. Do you want to put your paper on BioArchive right away? You click a button, that happens automatically. They don't even have to go to BioArchive. And, and both of these are very popular among sources. Uh, another collaboration we have with journals is um, this project called TRIP, Transparent Review and Preprint, which allows journals to post peer reviews of papers that are testing alongside a preprint on BioArchive. And this is really interesting because it, although the um, display of the peer review is next to the preprint, the decoupling is preserved because that pane that I've circled there is um, a hypothesis window. It's an annotation um, engine and that's actually controlled by eLife. It's not anything to do with BioArchive. BioArchive is just allowing it to be displayed there. So it's, it's an interesting example of, of how something can be de decoupled but very easily discoverable. And I think it's interesting to talk about this decoupling and the possibilities for um, innovation. And we're already seeing um, this be promoted by, um, by preprint. So here are just a few examples. Prelights is a service from the company of biologists, which is essentially a news and views for preprints. Pre-review pre is um, a, a, a sort of journal club for early career researchers that allows them to, 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 to learn how to peer review by looking at preprints, by looking at papers that have yet to um, undergo uh, uh, peer review. So that's kind of interesting. Um, review Commons and PCI are portable peer review initiatives. So you can post your preprint on BioArchive Review Commons and PCI, completely independent services, they will review your paper. Then you can take those reviews to a journal and say, well, what do you think? I've already had this peer review. Um, it's been interesting to see initiatives self-organizing um, among the community amid COVID-19. So Mount Sinai, Johns Hopkins, and University of Oxford have all created these networks where they're rapidly reviewing papers on MedArchive about COVID-19 because they, they think it's really important with millions of people looking at these papers that there is some, some context for, um, for readers, particularly those who may not be experts. And actually, um, MIT Press have taken this a, a step further by launching RRC19, which is essentially a journal whose entire purpose is to, um, is to, to review um, COVID-19 papers on bioarchive or medarchive. So it'll be interesting to see um, how that um, experiment works. And I think ultimately in a sort of post-COVID world, it will allow us to really answer the question about what peer review should look like in the 21st century. So, you know, I mean, we can ask the question, when should peer review take place? And I would argue that for 99.9% .9 of papers, the peer review should take place after they've been disseminated as a preprint so that people can start reading them. How do you peer review them? If you've already accomplished the dissemination, then maybe the pressure is off and you can think about what's the best way to um, peer review paper depending on the subject. Maybe if it's a clinical trial or a synthetic biology paper or a developmental biology paper, maybe you do something different. And because of the decoupling of the dissemination of, of the work and the peer review that is, that is enabled, who should do the peer review? Right now we have a system where um, Everybody talked about review of fatigue and how difficult it is to find peer reviewers. But simultaneously, there are complaints that the global south and early career researchers are hugely underrepresented in the peer review process. Again, does the, um, the decoupling, will that allow us to rethink peer review and allow that second problem, all these people who want to peer review papers and aren't, solve the first problem, which is that we don't have enough peer reviews? We'll see. And then finally, which papers should we peer review? There's a good argument that there are some papers, archival papers in a very, very niche area aimed at a small number of specialists, all of whom are perfectly capable of assessing them themselves. 
so I mean, one question is, do we need to bother to peer review those papers to, at all? And maybe the peer review is in the reading in those niche fields. That's you know, that's that's a question that we can we, we can ask and answer. Um, and I think it's it, it is important to think about peer review. It's, it's often an, it's often mistakenly felt that somehow posting a preprint means that you're not for peer review, or if you're in, in favour of preprints, that, that that you really you don't think much of peer review. I don't think that's the case. The decoupling doesn't mean that one doesn't take place. And I think in this day and age, in particularly, and that's a kind of you know the experience of COVID nineteen means that we really do need. Um, forms of review and um, we need to signal the trustworthiness of science and actually maybe we can start thinking about how we can do this better and so this is an article that Kathleen Hall Jameson who wrote Cyber War wrote with myself um, Vera McKimmer from PLOS and uh, Marshall McNutt who's president of the National Academy of Science and in it we talk about the different ways in which we can signal trustworthy of science and trustworthiness of science in articles including things like badges that show ethical adherence to various things, um, check, author checklists that um, people can go through, greater transparency, forward linking to um, uh, other discussions and, and, and events that take place after the article is available online, ID verification, etc. And all of these are things that um, could be enabled by uh, the, de the, the decoupling. So I think there's a lot of experiments that, that can be done, um, you know, in, in, in a post preprint world. Um, and just finally, I, I, I would like to thank everybody who's in, been involved in the work on BioArchive and MedArchive. It's, it's quite common to think that, um, you know, it's just a website and you're not doing any peer review, so you just sling things up there. But actually, it's taken a huge amount of work and it's, it's been incredible with the deluge of um, papers on COVID-19. So there's a lot of people at Coldspring Harbour who've been basically working seven days a week for months. So we have great collaborations with the Yale and BMJ team. Um, fantastic support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, technology partners, partnerships with Hiwa Press in um, Silicon Valley, Google and Hypothesis, and, um, and again, great collaborations with publishers like PLOS, EMBO, eLife, and, and the organizations like the Period of Science. So that's all I have to say today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was fantastic, Richard. And uh, we do have one, so we had two questions. One of them was retracted because he answered it in the talk. Uh, so the second one here is, do you have a sense of citation patterns for bioarchive preprints versus their traditionally published versions? So, oh, so the, well, so there's a couple of things there. So um, people, are, people are looking at citation numbers and um, what you see is the, the majority of the, um, the majority of citations accrue to the published version, but that will probably vary. I mean, when you look at journal citations, most of the most of the most of the citations happen in the second year after a paper is published. So, if you think that most preprints in about two years are going to be published in a journal paper, when people make a citation choice, they will choose the journal version, which I think is the right thing to do. So, I I think the numbers are somewhere between one and about five percent of citations to the preprint version. What is interesting is that there's a few signs now that if you compare papers that um, are posted on BioArchive and you try and find equivalent papers that were not posted as a preprint, then the ones that were posted on BioArchive get more citations in total. They definitely get more readers. And that's interesting because it suggests that maybe two bites of the cherry, the preprint and the um, published version get you more citations but there's a lot of confounding variables in that so i'm a bit hesitant to make any strong conclusions sounds good okay so um we do actually have another question but we do have to move on so i'm i'm going to be sure to flag that question and during the panel i'll bring that back up uh thank you so much richard this was fantastic this was excellent excellent Okay, so now I am going to queue up our second speaker. This is uh, Kathleen Carley. And uh, Dr. Carley is a professor of computer science in the Institute for Software Research here at CMU, an IEEE fellow and director of the Center for Computational Analysis of Social and Organizational Systems, uh, CASOS is the uh, abbreviation, and director of the Center for Informed Democracy and Social Cyber Security, uh, and that's here at CMU as well. And uh, very excited for this talk. Uh, 
and uh, Dr. Carly again, once you know, 15 minutes or so, once you start to get to about the two minute mark, I'll send you a private message in chat just to let you know. So oh, I have to keep chat open. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'll send you a private message. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. Feel free. Go ahead. All right. Um, so, um, Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for having me. So I'm going to be talking about disinformation and social influence, and in particular, trying to show you how that is currently being used to drive an anti-science bias and how it's actually being used to spread non-science as though it were science. Um, so in, of course, disinformation is not new. It's always been around. Um, on the left, you'll see a picture of a bas relief of Ramses II, where, Ram where Ramses is claiming that he won this uh, battle over the Hittite people. In point of fact, he really lost. And it, what did succeed, though, was his propaganda. Today, disinformation is much more uh, elaborate and costs much less to develop and probably doesn't last quite as long as that vast relief. But for example, a common one that is very science-oriented in during COVID-19 is that Bill Gates actually created the COVID-19 virus, the SARS-19, uh, SARS and that he, he did that in order to create a new world order because once the virus is out there and spread worldwide, it would cause everybody to go into lockdown. Once they were all in lockdown, they would then go cashless because no one can go to stores and everything has to be done without hands. And that at the same time, they would install 5G uh, towers all over, the, all over the world. And those would allow you to control RFID chips. Now that's true. Okay. And the RFID chips, though, could be implanted in bodies. And so the vaccine, which he also created, would be injected as it was injected into you, would contain an RFID chip that allowed the governments or the New World Order to control you through these 5G towers. This particular piece of pseudoscience, and they're even posting it as science, is actually all over the internet and is actually part of the campaign to convince people not to get vaccinated if and when the vaccine were to come out for COVID-19. Of course, it's simply not true. So how does disinformation spread and what is it like? Disinformation actually has many faces. You might think it's just inaccurate facts. In fact, that's not the dominant part of the problem. Uh, that's a play. There are there are fact checkers out there and so on, and you can look that. Deep fakes, as everyone's talking about today, again, those are extremely rare. But the real problem is that a lot of what's called disinformation is actually spread through the use of illogic, through unsupported opinions, through misleading anecdotes, and through pseudoscience. It is often spread by bots and trolls and memes and cyborgs conducting campaigns to both create groups who are receptive to these messages and then to spread those messages to them. The reason it works this way is because social media, much like science, is organized into topic groups. That is, you have a set of people who are interested in a particular issue, like we're all interested in DNA, or we're all interested in network science, or we're all interested in uh, the World Cup. Okay, And those people talk to each other, but they also talk about the same things. These groups online can become very pathological, just as academic departments can, because they not only do they talk to each other, they only talk to each other, and they own and they get into what's called an echo chamber, where they're all talk very very tightly connected and very much talking about the same thing. And once they are in those forms, it is very easy to send excite messages or dismay messages, and actually topple those groups over. Um, through the psychological process called amygdala hijack into it responding to the world emotionally rather than rationally. And at that point, if you can do that, you've lost them to scientific and critical thinking. So, in, so what is happening is that messages are crafted and people are adjusting things through um, the digital airways to actually um, take advantage of the way things like Google search works or the prioritization rules in Twitter, et cetera, so that their messages always get to you first. It is much easier to find pseudoscience on Google, for example, than it is to find real science. Uh, they, they also exploit the way your mind works and the, and the kind of confirmation biases you have, your escalation of commitment to make you think that once you found this piece of information, it is true. And in fact, studies now show that people 
do are not able to generally discern what information is false, particularly if it comes, if it appears to be part of their group's norm. Okay, so for example, Democrats can't tell that Democratic falsehoods are false, Republicans cannot tell that Republican falsehoods are false, for example. Um, in addition, all these things are exploiting something called social cognition, which is these heuristics that our brain uses to make sense in ter of the world in terms, then the vast quantities of information in terms of generalizations and in terms of groups. So when you hear people say, well, everybody knows. So if everybody knows that the moon is made of green cheese, then you'll say, aha, yeah, I guess I did. I guess it is made of green cheese. And social cognition actually leads you through an influence process to start believing and thinking with those that you interact with lead and believe. So on social media, we just get you to interact with the right people or non-people, and then you will start believing and thinking about those kinds of things. Similar kind of processes underlie why there are camps in science that fight about the different approaches to solving a particular problem. Some of the key ideas, of course, is that there are these now with social media and with online archives, there are these super spreaders who have extreme capability of getting their message out there. That doesn't mean anybody believes it, it just means it gets out to a lot of people. So one of the things that you see happening is you see super spreaders out there spouting pseudoscience and it gets the information gets out to tons of people. Then you have these super friends who are involved in two-way dialogues that talk you back and forth. They, well, you know, this is kind of true. Yeah, I really think it's kind of true. Well, my cousin said, and they get involved in dialogues with you and can convince you of things that aren't true. And finally, there's the echo chambers, which on the surface look like a lot of these super friends. What is being manipulated is actually both the content, the stories that are being told, the narrative, the words that are being used and the way things are described, as well as the groups. Groups in, in the online forums, and it doesn't matter if you're talking about Reddit or you know, Google groups or anything like that, are being manipulated so that they are constructing who is actually talking to whom and who the opinion leaders are. And this can all be done, of course, by just simple messaging. The kinds of tools that are used are bots, which are fully automated accounts, cyborgs that are part human, part bots, trolls that are humans hiding under pseudonyms, and so on, as well as utilizing memes, utilizing the subconscious cues and messages, such as light colors and happy words, to make you think about things a certain way, and of course, deep fakes and videos. All of these things are out there. These things are used together to create what are called fake persona. Fake persona are things that you, that you might think is a real person, like a real scientist, but they don't really exist. And these fake persona are actually have underlying them teams of people who write fake science papers, some of which actually have gotten into ArchIV. I don't know about the medical one, they've gotten into ArchIV, the computer science one. Um, in terms of understanding the influence campaigns, we often look at who is communicating what to whom with what impact. And a lot what we find is that in fact the way you communicate is by getting people to engage in particular discussions creating excitement uh, enhancing messages dismissing certain messages creating distractions there's a set of tactics that are actually used to actually spread disinformation or even regular information now some of these tactics involve shaping the content but other tactics such as building a group or bridging between two groups or nuking an opinion leader are actually shaped are actually designed to actually affect who is talking to whom and to actually create, like I said, local opinion leaders for particular things. So we've actually developed measures for all of these things and can actually measure them on posts. And those posts could be social media posts. They could also be abstracts and um, authorship lists from uh, various um, uh, articles online or in other archives. These. Uh, Techniques are actually used to conduct influence operations uh, to actually change how you think about things. For example, during Trident Juncture, which is a NATO exercise, they had this thing called the Viking Warrior Campaign to try to convince people to, to that NATO was good and to join NATO because it was filled with you know, lots of good looking guys who were out there doing their bit for humanity. That was a very, very expensive campaign. 
disinformation can be very cheap. For example, Russia put out this dismay campaign where they showed simply a meme of the defense minister of Russia coupled with a meme of the defense ministers of Sweden, Norway, and the Netherlands. The implication is Russia is strong, NATO is weak because they have all these nice women who smile running the military and they don't really understand the military. It had much higher impact. Disinformation can be done very, very, very cheaply. And therefore it can be spread very quickly. These are two more disinformation campaigns. One used to build a group and one used to nuke a group. On the left, what you're seeing is a campaign that was done with bots where you had a set of young men who did not know each other, but they had one thing in common. They all liked to share light porn images of women. They did not know each other, they didn't so on. Bots came in and started sending out messages that actually told each of the guys about each other, which formed a group of these young guys. And then once they did that, they then told them where to go to get uh, rifles and where to go start fighting uh, in the Euromaidan revolution. So they created revolutionaries. That same tactic we're seeing today being used uh, in the anti-vax campaigns to, to actually build groups that are anti-science who hadn't even thought about science prior to that. Uh, on the right, you're seeing what's called a typical geofence or a denial of service attack in social media, where they're just blanketing the airwaves uh, and therefore covering all of Finland with just simply counting from zero to infinity um, in Finnish numbers. Okay, and therefore blanking out all the other information so you can't even go in and see what they're talking about. These kind of tactics have also been used during COVID-19 to blank out certain areas and to actually attack certain underrepresented groups. In a polarization campaigns, what you see is you have bots, trolls, cyborgs join groups, like they've joined the pro-vax groups. They've joined the anti-vax groups. Then they, that boosts the numbers of those. Then they send out things that build more connections among the members, which is basically converting them to be more and more like an echo chamber. Then they wait for some message to come out that is pro or that is either happy or angry on one side or the other. And then they counter it with messages on the other side, which are then amplified by bots. So for example, the story comes out that says, hey, there's a new vaccine uh, for COVID. The, the uh, anti-vax side will say, yeah, but it actually has the RFID chip in it. So it, they're gonna control you or it's going to sterilize you. So don't take it. So, and the, which makes the groups angrier. Then they engage with more backing and engaging community by building up the opinion leaders, getting these two groups to not talk to each other and getting them to be more and more upset, which actually makes it hard and will make it hard uh, to actually deliver a vaccine once it actually comes out. So disinformation campaigns, you basically are done like this. You find the controversial issues, you embed bots and trolls on each side, you build the ties, you foster fear on one side, you call for protests, you spread disinformation, so on. This tactic was actually used on the Reopen America campaigns. Um, we saw new accounts created. We saw a spike in those. Those new accounts came in. The ones that were um, pro reopen were all coordinated and organized and started spreading not just pro reopen messages but at the same time anti-science messages at the same time anti-vax messages do not wear mask messages and they cited papers that had appeared in preprint series and linked to series that said that you don't really need masks they won't necessarily save you from COVID-19. They also had stories about fake pandemics and uh, that fake job losses and, and people and hospitals being empty. Uh, in our own state, in Pennsylvania, what we saw is they formed an echo chamber that was focused around uh, the pro you know, reopen side that was filled with a large number of bots. These bots not only pushed the anti-science, the uh, pro reopen side, but they also began, some of them began to attack Governor Wolf. One of the bots in particular, that girl Sandra Five, was, was actually backing up alternative opinion leaders and building up them, was actually building up the group and was bringing a more excitement to them about where and when the various protests would be as part of this campaign. She is also one of the ones who is spreading an anti science message. So disinformation is all, that is being spread is also spreading intolerance. In the Philippines and in many other countries, the increase in disinformation during COVID-19 has led to hate communities forming. These often rapidly go away, but in the US they have managed to stay and become very stable. And although many of them started off as being, you know, 
uh, negative toward the people on the ships and negative, you know, toward China, they have now become very stable and they are being redirected in their hate toward negativity toward science and negativity toward um, Democrats and negativity toward, you know, the African American community and negativity toward the LGBTQ community and so on. And they are being directed at a variety of things. At the same time, uh, bots are basically being used to link more and more of these hate groups together and make them larger and larger and larger. Associated with that has been a growing anti-science trend in the social media. And in particular, we saw a surge in April with a surge of new attacks against expert advisors. And of those spreading that information on Twitter, 69% had bought like behavior. So we saw this increase in attacks and an increase in memes that were directed at trying to um, reduce the scientific influence. Um, so these are some of the things I and my group study. We can find out more on our website and so on here, but with that, I'll stop. Wonderful, you did perfect on time. <laughs> that was absolutely perfect. Uh, let's see. Um, yeah, Dr. Carly, I didn't see any questions come in, at least at this stage. I'm sure at the panel we will. Uh, if anybody in the next 30 seconds has a question, feel oh, free to. There's one. Sorry, I'm just. Um... Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe Alex, would you uh, like to unmute yourself? Sure. Um... My name's Lex Kravitz. I was just wondering if there's effective ways to reduce the influence of these bot networks and whether it requires the social media companies themselves or what your thoughts are on, on solutions. Yeah, so um, let me begin by saying that there are a lot of bot networks that are actually doing good things. For example, bot networks are also used to warn people that tsunamis are coming and so on. And some of the bot networks just simply rebroadcast news. So they're not all created equal. Um, it, you, there are things you can do to stop them. One is is you yourself to quit, you know, don't just automatically follow anyone who follows you because you're actually giving them, that a lot of those will be bots and you're giving them more power. Make sure you actually physically know people. The, uh, the other thing is just because something's trending in your inbox, don't go with what's at the top, actually scroll down because the bots are getting it at the top. And if you go down, you'll get more real information often. So those are a couple of things you can do. You can also report bots, although Twitter and other places are very unlikely. They don't really like taking them down because it's against their business model. And it takes a lot to actually prove that something's a bot. So one of the best things you can do in that sense is just ignore them. All right, thank you. Yeah. Let's see, and we have, we have, uh, we have time. So we had one more that came into um, it is, uh, yeah, so the question is, is it good to differentiate between trolls and bots, or can you consider them as potential hybrid, hybrid uh, troll bots? Is that a conversation that ever comes up? Yeah, so we actually, um, the way we use the term troll, it, it has to be a human being. It's a human being who's hiding under a fake persona, who is actually engaged in hate speech and in what's called identity bashing. That means they're, they pick like a subgroup like it may be police or it may be um you know uh, an ethnic minority like muslim or it may be a um you know some other kind of group and they will start using hate speech against those kinds of groups so that's the way we use trolls we recognize that in the media sometimes they'll talk about troll farms often they're talking about individuals running a set of bots and those are what we call cyborgs And uh, one more very quick one. Again, we're still doing great on time. Um, this one, you, I think you had started to address quite a bit. Uh, the question is, how do we, yeah, so the person just said you pretty much addressed this. It was the idea of, you know, just becoming self-aware and kind of ourselves becoming vaccinated against this, you know, yeah. against sort of, yeah, and uh, yeah, you did a great job in addressing that. So, okay, great. Well, if any others come in, I'll, we'll uh, look at those in the panel. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Carly. Mm -hmm. okay. My pleasure. Okay, so I am going to introduce our third and final speaker of the session. Uh, I'm very happy to introduce Sarah Kidden. And uh, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and get the bio up. So Sarah Kidden is a technologist and researcher uh, working at the intersection of technology and society. 
Uh, she's a Marie Curie Research Fellow on Open Design of Trusted Things, which is a joint program between Northumbria University and Mozilla. And her research focuses on the impact of technology and the internet for grassroots communities and neighborhoods. So uh, yeah, Sarah, you can feel free to um, go ahead, share screen. And, and again, once you get to about the two minute mark, I'll just send you a private message in chat. Uh, thank you. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, I should begin by apologizing that I do not have slides like the other panelists, but I'll try my very best to explain my points. Uh, thank you to the previous panelists for the excellent presentations. My name is Sarah Kiden and I am a Marie Curie Research Fellow on Open Dot, as I have already been introduced. Uh, our project aims to explore how to build a more open, secure and trustworthy Internet of Things. So the project started at the University of Dundee in Scotland, where I'm currently based, and it has now moved to Northumbria University in Newcastle. And my research is basically trying to explore possibilities for smaller scale local Internet of Things technology and how communities and neighborhoods can be supported in making the best use of them. And to the focus of my talk today, uh, also talking about other spaces that I have been involved in, I'll be talking about openness for internet policy and building equity. So I just wanted to start by saying that as human beings, we are curious naturally. If you see, um, if you hide something or if you see words like confidential, top secret, suddenly you just want to know what's behind those words and it's just by nature that we want to be like this. And in fact, a lot of misunderstandings happen because we are not being open, even if sometimes there is nothing to hide. And I want to use the example of in openness in internet policy and why I believe that such openness should be encouraged in other spaces. Let me take you back to 1969 to the Advanced Research Projects Agency Network, commonly known as ARPANET, which has now grown to be the internet as we know it. Uh, I think this information is known by many, but for the benefit of those who do not know, uh, ARPANET was run by the United States Department of Defense, and it was the first network or internet related project geared towards research. So in September of 1969, the UCLA was the very first location to host the first node on the internet. And the first message or email, if you will, was sent to Stanford Research Institute, which was node two in October of the same year. So by the end of 1969, ARPANET was able to connect four locations. You had UCLA, University of California in Santa Barbara, Stanford Research Institute, and Utah. Um, 10 years later, of course, it was no longer just the four nodes. And it was very hard to draw the geographic map of the network or the internet uh, because of the, comp the complex connections. And now it's even more complex if you add the layers of products and services that run on the internet from multiple locations. So it's interesting for me to note that something that started as two nodes or four nodes connecting with each other has become very powerful, very big, and in my opinion, very hard to predict. And the fact that we are able to actually present today uh, via Zoom and other conferencing software is just a testament to this uh, enormous growth. Um, so, but of course, this growth is not something that happened just like that. There were many things that happened or th that helped to make it happen. And the one of the things is openness. So the open nature of the networks and architecture allowed people to contribute, to add new protocols, to add new services. And the internet today still allows for many platforms and services to be added because of the foundation that was set. So I attended sessions yesterday and today and uh, open access is something that has come up frequently, I think in almost all the sessions I've attended. And related to the growth of the internet is open access for request for comments or RFCs, if you've heard about them, which are formal documents drafted by the Internet Engineering Task Force that describe the specifications for a particular technology. So these RFCs are actually public documents. They are posted publicly. They are accessed by anyone. And anyone in the community is actually free to, to propose something, to write a policy proposal and submit it to the community. And I think this is actually a, it's a, a strength of the internet and the growth of the internet, especially in technical uh, standards making bodies. 
And so if you go to spaces like the Internet Corporation for Sign Names and Numbers, where I participate in the at large advisory committee, uh, where we represent interests of Internet end users to uh, ICANN and to other spaces, uh, you find that participation is open and all policies are developed in what you, you say is a multi stakeholder approach. So basically, it's not just the technical community, but there are different groups. You have internet service providers, governments, uh, civil society, uh, security people, and different people just coming together to, you know, to project, if you will, the, the internet. So the internet has been defined as a network of networks, many small, medium, and large networks connected to make the one big internet. And I like to use the analogy of the internet being some sort of incomplete puzzle that requires different stakeholders to complete. So it belongs to no one, and yet it also belongs to, to everyone. So everyone basically plays their part and you complete your piece of the puzzle. And I would like to recommend a book, Roads and Bridges, The Unseen Labor Behind Our Digital Infrastructure by Nadia Ekbal. I'll post a link on the chat if you've not read it. I think it's a very good book that talks about um, interesting things, basically, like how you, you take care of your physical infrastructure, like roads and bridges. You should do the same with digital infrastructure as well. And how, uh, you know, medical records, banks, and things like that are running on free and public code. It's, it's a really good book that uh, I like, uh, I, I liked to read. And um, so in if my, car, my current research right now in Internet of Things, of course, netizens are growing in number and I should say actually exploding because we are not just connecting people, we are connecting things, all sorts of things, billions of things. And we need to understand and learn from the current standards and what has worked in order to build a future Internet. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that the Internet right now is perfect and great. Uh, because of openness and the multi-stakeholder approach. As you've heard from the previous speaker, there are so many issues surrounding the internet and technologies in general. You have bias in artificial intelligence systems, surveillance, misinformation, the spread of fake news, just so many issues generally. But I think what we need to learn from this is what has helped the internet to grow from just four nodes to billions of nodes right now. So moving on to building equity, um, I just want to say that adding the word open to anything does not make it open in real sense. Uh, I've seen like many people will add open to, to make it feel like their project is open, but there are so many issues to consider. Uh, sometimes the space might be open, so it's open software or it's open, whatever you call it. And there are even some um, seats on the table, but that does not mean that everyone is welcome. Sometimes we have to extend an invitation to underrepresented voices to have them join us on the table. And once people are on the table, it also does not mean that they have a voice. Um, there are so many power structures, uh, even in open spaces, and those with more power contribute more than those with very little or no power. And some also you have issues like resources. So you have a seat on the table, you have some voice, but you don't, you can't even afford the resources because to participate in these open movement things from coding to software to policy, it's usually on a volunteer basis. And many times you're either self-funded or you have external funding to allow you participate in open spaces. And then I just want to highlight something that has always been with us, but somehow, either we were not aware or we chose to ignore or it has been made visible and in our faces uh, because of the COVID-19 pandemic and that is the digital divide. Uh, I'd just like to remind you that uh, the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, is still reporting that 53% of the world's population actually has access to the internet. That's slightly half uh, slightly more than half of the world's population, depending on who is counting. So three months ago, uh, I mean, three months into the lockdown, I wrote a blog for a project website and I was basically reflecting on things I had seen and observed. Um, I, I grew up in East Africa, partly in Kenya and mostly in Uganda, and I'm currently living in the UK. So I was uh, like, while keeping in touch with my family and friends and living here physically, I was just trying to compare things on both sides of the world. And so on the one hand, you had one part of the population that continued business as usual. They were working from home, attending classes online, you know, shopping online and things like that. 
but there was another part of the population that's completely cut off from information, from work, from class content, because they don't have access to technology and to the internet. And it's particularly sad for me because at the end of the day, both uh, categories of people are required to perform and compete in the exact same way. So we need to think about these issues and we need to just constantly remember that as we fight for these things and as we build the tools, that there's another half of the world's population that actually has no access and yet they are affected by all the decisions that we make. So I watched as people posted pictures of virtual graduation ceremonies, they were defending their PhD thesis. And you know, I was just imagining that there's another part of the world where, you know, uh, people had been cut off from everything. And this experience is not unique to developing countries alone. In the UK, for example, I know the government put in something like one billion pounds to tackle the impact uh, of lost teaching time because of the pandemic. And I think out of that, about a hundred million pounds was invested in remote education and delivering laptops and internet to people who uh, need it the most. So what does this tell us? It basically tells us that the way we've been doing things is not working well, and we have to find other ways basically of doing this, especially in a world that's becoming more technology driven. And I think I'm going to stop here. I'll be happy to take any questions, if any. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was fantastic. And I am just, uh, again, you can feel free to send me questions in the chat or uh, can feel free to raise your hand and unmute yourself as well if you have a question. Uh, let's see. Give it a couple. Yeah, Sarah, um, I had a question for you just to sort of, uh, you know, start it off here. I loved the point that you made that, you know, just by having the word open, <laughs> it doesn't automatically mean that it's, it's going to be this welcoming, accepting environment. There's a lot of things going on that can impact that. And I think a lot of us on this call are working in these open science initiatives, uh, some of us as librarians, some of us as in industry, so on and so forth. And uh, I guess what would be, um, you know, some of your words of wisdom for us, just like on a daily basis, things that we can remember as we're having these conversations on open science and open technology and, and things like that. I would just love to hear your perspective on that. Yeah, so just to re-echo what the previous panelist was saying is you can't do everything basically, like you just have your part to play. And uh, this is why I was talking about it as a puzzle basically. So you get your piece and you contribute to it. And if you're looking at it from a multi-stakeholder point of view, everyone has a different role to play. So if we start from government, their role will be in terms of policy and ensuring that the policy is actually effective and it's doing the right things. But if you look at developers, uh, how responsible is the technology technology that you're building, you know, is it actually building equity? Is it ensuring, uh, is it giving us social justice and things like that? If you look at us activists, um, like we just have to continue pushing, <laughs> like we'll push the government, we'll push the technologies, we'll push everyone to do their part. So it's not, um, it's not like what, there's one solution to everything. I think everyone just play, puts their parts of the puzzle and then we'll all complete this puzzle that I was talking about. Excellent. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and so we have, um, we're doing pretty good on time. So we have some questions coming in too. I'm going to go ahead and pose uh, one of them to you and the rest, uh, hopefully we'll get to in the panel. The first is, um, what are your thoughts on what we can do to try and equalize access to research data? speaking to myself. So there are so many things. I, I want to start with the point I was talking about access to the internet. So like the basics, because before we even talk about access to research data, if we're talking about online data, like right now with the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to give people access to the very basic thing that's access to the internet. So there are many solutions. You can find low cost solutions to giving people access to the internet. I don't know if you've heard about community networks where communities are actually building and maintaining their own networks using, you know, very low cost solutions and things like that. So encourage things like that, encourage uh, communities to be able to develop solutions that work for them. And then after that, we start talking about, you know, uh, giving people access to resources. Though I think that has improved. If you look maybe 10 years ago, the access to data that we had 
10 years ago is not the same that we have right now. So for me, I would personally say that we start with the basics and then build on to that. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, well, at this point, I want to invite our three speakers uh, you know, back, I guess, <laughs> back. if we were in person, we'd have you all come to the front, but uh, we've got so many great questions coming in and uh, I'm trying to do what I can to sort of um, meld them. And so it's something that everybody could kind of speak towards, but apologies if some of these seem like they are again, quite directed. Uh, so I'm gonna go to my list. It's a very long list, which is great. Uh, so this is a question for Richard, but I, I really think that anybody could probably speak towards this because it's that theme of participation that keeps coming up, you know, it's these open networks and participation. And the question is, um, at BioArchive and, and just in general, is there any contempl like, um, contemplation for a mechanism for flagging preprints that are never published? So they're put out there, but then never published. Like, is there a mechanism to track those? Um, well, so it's difficult. It's difficult. I, I guess the question is, is what does that mean, right? So, I mean, the simple answer is that we we flag preprints that are published. So, if the preprint is not published, then you know there's an absence of a signal, right? So, in some respects there is, the, the mechanism is just not having the thing that says that it's being published. The question is, is what that means? And that's where it becomes tricky. So, you know, it, I mean, on, on, on a bigger, longer talk I give, I give examples of some papers that are five years in peer review. So what does it mean? What does it mean? Do you wait five years and then say that? I mean, there are examples, you saw that curve I showed, there's lots of papers that after two, I mean, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day who was like, you know, I'm trying to get this paper into nature. It's been two years. So when, when would you do that? The other thing is, another thing I didn't mention is that there's clearly a subgroup, a small subgroup of papers. We're seeing quite a few of these with COVID-19 where there's never any intent to publish the work in the first place. So that's kind of, so the reproducibility studies, some of them are like that. Um, but, but, you know, with COVID-19, you see an epidemiological study that's coming out of China in February you know, in the normal course of events, you know, you would wait X months and then that would appear in a journal, but, but you know, X months and the state of play has changed a lot. So it's almost kind of like a progress report. So I think that's, I think the notion of flagging something as not published doesn't really make sense. But I do think this is where in my last slide, I talked about how evolution of publishing could take place with badges and the kind of appending of symbol signals, different signals of trust to, to manuscripts. And so, you know, the fact that it's in that med archive itself means that it's gone through some sort of screening, screening process. So people don't think it's non-science or pseudoscience, but it might still be totally wrong. Then you can imagine these papers accumulate a variety of other things. And so I think that's, that. I suspect that's the, the, the way um, we'll go. And the Center for Open Science are doing some inter interesting things with badges. And um, I think things like some ethics tech test will, will will kind of sit in that in that ecosystem if that makes sense it does yeah uh, so the next question is really for all three of you uh, do the panelists see any conflict between solutions intended to have immediate impact on current problems and solutions intended to have a more long-term impact on those foundational issues where those benefits might not be seen for some time. Do we have any thoughts on that? And uh, the person uh, who asked that question, you, you can feel free to unmute yourself if you'd like, if you'd like to add anything to that. Yeah, that was me, but I think you asked it pretty faithfully. <laughs> so, um, I'll, I'll start us off. Um, we, we actually see that solutions that are designed to only have an immediate impact when they are taken up by governments and by policymakers often um, have a long-term impact and often outlive their usefulness. So if they rarely die an early death. Okay, we also see that things that would have a long-term impact 
are less likely to get funded are less you know it's not the glamour as glamorous of research and we often don't see as many people who are um we often see more people who have humanitarian interests and less technology interests involved in working on those so we often so those are some of the tensions that we often see um in terms of but let me reverse it and turn it around and say um one of the reasons why disinformation is weird is, is that it has both a short and a long-term impact and people often only go after the short-term impact. You know, it's like, okay, can we remove, you know, all the stories about, you know, drink, you know, drink, drink bleach and you'll get rid of COVID. Okay. And things like that. They're disinformation. But without thinking about what that is doing to the long term, you know, it has impacts for who is actually communicating with you. They're not, it does it, and by, and it also doesn't get at the real intent of some of those messages, which was not necessary, which was, yes, people drinking bleach, it's great if it's, you know, if it's all the people we don't like who drink it, but the real intent of those messages was not that. The real intent was to signal that there was this white supremacy cult that was becoming a religion and to get people to join it and they succeeded. And that is the long-term impact. So often we don't even study long-term impacts. So yeah, I mean, actually something that, that you just said um, rang through for me, this, that, 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 that this, like, there is a danger occasionally with some sort of short-termism approaches. We have a similar ph uh, phenomenon where, you know, every now and then, um, you know, an author decides that a paper is wrong or there's some ethical issue with the paper on bioarchive. And so what we do is we, an archive do the same thing, is we execute what's called a withdrawal. But just like a journal retraction, we don't actually remove the paper. What happens is that the, it is labeled as withdrawn, the DOI defaults to a withdrawal notice, but you can still go and see the thing that was withdrawn. And sometimes we actually have disputes with authors about this and they say, oh, it was wrong. There was a screw up. My student wasn't supposed to do this. I just want you to take it down. And we, what, the response to that is, you know, that would be the wrong thing to do because it might feel good in the short term. But the reality is that that paper, you know, that, that there will be digital footprints across the web for that. People would have indexed that. You know, we can't go and tell Google to unindex it. Somebody would have downloaded the PDF. Um, people will have taken the DOI, and if they go back and they go to a 404, they will say, oh, there's something fishy. What the hell happened here? And they might actually think worse of you as an author. Mm -hmm. Whereas actually, if we're transparent and we say, there was a paper here, it has been withdrawn, you can go and see what was withdrawn, but the important thing is that the authors say they don't want it to be considered as part of the citation record for these reasons, and everybody's transparent about it, then actually in the long term, it will be better for you as an author, particularly for, for an innocent vice, bystander. Um, so, you know, so that, that certainly rings true. And I think there are, there are a few little examples like that. Yeah. So I, I would just like to add that, of course, technology advances very fast, that sometimes by the time you have the solution, uh, whatever you're developing the solution for is actually obsolete. Though the Ultimately, I think I, I should say that solutions should solve a particular need. So uh, you're developing solutions to solve that need that you have and not just. Uh, great, great. Okay, so I'm, uh, I've got another question here. And again, um, I would say this is probably focused more towards uh, Richard and, and Sarah, but uh, again, anybody can feel free to comment on this, but it's the idea of, um, you know, so we have the internet, as Sarah mentioned, nobody owns it, but everybody owns it. It's sort of at that intersection. And in terms of encouraging people to, you know, stakeholders to play that substantive role in providing comments and, and adding discourse to these kind of things. And the specific question that really came from this is, when we think about uh, bioarchive and how a lot of articles are, you know, there's things on Twitter, there's conversations happening. What the, the questioner said is the discussion of a lot of articles seems to just be limited to retweets where people are announcing, here's this preprint. 
And does BioArchive plan to increase or incentivize sort of a more substantive academic discussion of those posted? So again, that's very directed towards Richard, but I think in general uh, for our other two speakers, it's sort of that idea of how do we encourage, you know, healthy discourse <laughs> around any of these topics in open science, open technology, uh, disinformation, so on and so forth. So we, I mean, we obviously want to encourage that. We do have, um, uh, you know, we get on-site comments of about 8%, which I always say seems pretty low until you compare it to journals, which is much, much lower. And, and, um, and there's a lot of discussion on Twitter and, and third-party venues. I think that the challenge is, is that we, we can do this, but it's not clear to me how much BioArchive or MedArchive themselves can do. I mean, one of the, one of the challenges we find for any kind of the, um, a participation like this is academic incentives. Academic, I mean, I always say the most precious commodity to any academic is their time. And everybody has no time to do anything. And so when, you're, when academics think about how they apportion time, they think about you know, what benefit do they get from it. There may be situations in which there's a direct benefit for them to engage in that kind of discussion that's public and open. But actually, right now, there's not much of a, a real incentive to do so. I mean, one of the things that I, I think would help is particularly for early career researchers. Right now, the currency of career progression is solely the papers that you produce. Um, and early career researchers at that point in their careers have very few papers. But you know, if we can get to a point where some of the um, contributions into discussions become more formalized and in some way recognized as a contribution. So I mean, I always, I always say that if I'm trying to hire somebody in scientific communication editing or something like that, they will I'll typically see their CV, which is like, these are the two papers that I did in genetics that took me the last four years. But actually it'd be really valuable to me for the sorts of things that I want to employ them to do, if as well as those two things, they had like 15 um, other contributions where they would examine somebody else's work. And if we can start, if, if, but I think that will take institutions to start saying, we recognize these things as valid academic contributions. And so, you know, I'm, I'm all for it, but I, I don't think there's that much beyond providing a venue. Um, I don't think there's that much we can do. I mean, it's significant to me that we had this, you know, explosive growth um, of med archives in COVID-19, the, the exponential growth of bioarchives from 2013 to 2020, all of this indicates that it was satisfying a need. We haven't seen the same kind of um, growth in the dialogue, but it's difficult to know what one should compare it against. I mean, there is a hell of a lot of discussion going on on Twitter, which you know didn't exist pre-Twitter, didn't exist pre-bioarchive. So, you know, um, hopefully it'll come. So I wanted to follow up on that a little bit. In social media, a lot of the discussion is driven by uh, what's printed in blogs and and by images and and in videos that you see in YouTube. You know, if there was, if people in science got credit for writing blogs and blog posts and got credit for doing YouTube video, you'd see a higher discussion level about real science. Because right now there are bloggers out there blogging about pseudoscience and about anti non-scientific facts and writing videos about them. That, and a lot of the discussion is centering on that. But if we could somehow prioritize those as recognizable, acceptable things that people could get credit for, you would drive more discussion. Sarah, I, I hope I didn't hit it. I was just gonna, one thing just to add there, I mean, one piece of data that may be interesting here for, for you is that when we survey, we survey several thousand bioarchive authors um, a year or so ago, and actually, you know, what we found was a substantial number of them were engaging in conversations based on their papers by email. So I think that's the other thing you need to consider. We, we all want to have open discussion, but there are some kind of discussions that people either by the nature of what they're talking about or, or by character want to have privately. And you know, that, that's a bit of a, you know, it's, it's, um, that's a bit of a shift to happen to say, take a conversation that you're having personally with an author about their results and saying, okay, now, now have that publicly so 6 billion people can listen to it and different people will make different choices. And, but I, th I think we're moving in that direction, but it's a bit of 
Yeah, and and yeah, Sarah, I was interested in hearing your perspective, especially with you know the open technology that you were talking about. And uh, again, I, I keep going back to this point because it was so prolific. The idea that the the internet's there, nobody owns it, and everybody owns it. And um, I'm interested to hear you know from your perspective the idea of encouraging you know healthy dialogue and encouraging stakeholders to really. I guess, play a part in this. Um, what has your experience been like in, in that? Uh, yeah, so if I, I think generally my experience has been very good. Uh, maybe I've just been lucky that I've met people who are welcoming. And uh, if you go to ICANN, Inter uh, Internet Corporation for Sign Names and Numbers, for example, they'll have a fellowship program to introduce you to uh, po internet policy development. And they'll tell you this is how you get involved in internet policy. And uh, generally, I think right now there are programs that help you to get involved in those spaces. The only thing is you need to know about them for you to be able to participate, which information I don't think is so much out there. But I, I think generally it's open, it's welcoming if you have the information. And yeah, perhaps we need to do more outreach and creating awareness about people and telling them why they need to contribute to internet policy. Because I know when I started participating about four years ago, uh, I didn't even think that I can contribute to internet policy. I was just like, oh, that's that thing there. It's for those guys over there. but if we know that the internet affects all of us, then we are more willing to actually participate. Yeah. That is an incredibly prolific way to, uh, to end this session. And I know I have at least a dozen more questions. That I, and I, I apologize to anybody that we didn't that we get, didn't get to during this. Um, I'm going to throw these questions into Slack in our OSS channel. Um, and uh, you know we can feel free to have that conversation over there as well. But I just wanted to thank the three of you so much. This was such a fantastic, uh, fantastic panel, fantastic session. All the talks seemed to very you know complement each other, and and uh, all three of you were very very uh, yeah. I'm I'm humbled to listen to your talks. So okay, well, so this is some uh, business more for the greater the broader OSS meeting today. Uh, we're going to go to our lunch break now and we're going to return i want it's 2 p.m i believe yes 2 p.m uh, in the meantime obviously um hydrate be sure to have lunch uh, stretch if possible we also have gather town open available to you and i believe there's a gather town link earlier in the chat here and i'm going to go ahead and just uh repost this so you have it and Gather Town is a way that you can continue the conversations, if you'd like, that we uh, had earlier today. It's a it's a fun little fun little platform to uh, have conversations and and meet different people. Uh, so it, yeah, at that, thank you so much, everybody, and we'll see you back here at two o'clock. Thanks very much. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks.